Hello and welcome everybody. Um, I'm Joni Franklin, Content Director at BirdNote. It is so lovely to see so many people in the chat. I love that you're all sharing um, where you're from. I'm uh, located in Louisville, Kentucky, so it's nice to be with you today and um, really excited to have a, a conversation with uh, Drew Lanham here in a bit. Um, again, I'm Content Director for BirdNote as of February, so it's, it's, it's good to uh, be here with you all. Um, so a few housekeeping uh, items to get to before we talk to Drew. Um, this event is being recorded and closed captioning is available as an option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we wanna make sure that this is a kind and welcoming environment for everyone. So if you're sharing any spam, any bullying or harassment, that will get you booted from the event. Uh, we're excited to share that we have almost 1200 registrants for this event. Uh, from the U.S., Canada, and a number of other countries around the world. And uh, again, we'd love to know where you're joining uh, from, so please continue to share uh, where you're uh, attending uh, this event from in the chat. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. We're going to hear from Dr. J. Drew Lanham. Uh, he'll be reading his letters to birds, and these are letters that he wrote exclusively for Bird Note Daily. So you'll hear them as Bird Note Daily episodes uh, very soon. Uh, we're also going to talk to him about, you know, his inspiration behind each letter and his relationship uh, with the birds that uh, he writes to. A little bit about Bird Note. Bird Note is an independent nonprofit media production organization that connects millions of people around the world with nature and birds through powerful storytelling. Uh, we believe that birds connect us with the joy and wonder of nature. By telling vivid, sound-rich stories about birds and the challenges they face, Bird Note inspires listeners to care about the natural world and take steps to protect it. Since 2005, we've expanded from playing on just one public radio station to now airing on more than 275 radio stations in North America, with more than 5 million daily radio listeners in the U.S. and a global listening base through podcast. Our shows, including Bird Note Daily, Bird Note in Espanol, Threatened, and Bring Birds Back are free to everyone and available at birdnote.org or uh, on your podcast app. Uh, Bird Note is an independent nonprofit, and that means we don't receive financial support from radio stations, advertising, or government grants. Uh, Bird Note is free to everybody, including your local radio station. So most of the funding we use to produce Bird Note shows and events like this one uh, come from generous people just like you who value Bird Note enough to contribute. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, and I think you're going to, um, and you want to be part of our work to help people feel more connected to the natural world, please consider donating at any amount that is meaningful to you. And you can use the link in the chat for that. Uh, you can learn more about Bird Note at birdnote.org or by following us at Bird Note Radio on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Uh, now the man of the hour. Uh, J. Drew Lanham is an ornithologist, a naturalist, writer, and poet. He is one of the 2022 American Birding Association's Birders of the Year and also a 2022 MacArthur Fellow. He's an alumni distinguished professor, provost professor, and master teacher of wildlife ecology at Clemson University, where his most recent scholarly efforts address the confluences of race, place, and nature. And Drew is the poet laureate of Edgefield County, South Carolina, and the author of Sparrow Envy, a field guide to birds and lesser beasts, and the home place, memoirs of a colored man's love affair with nature. Please join me in welcome, uh, Drew Lanham. Hey, Drew. Hey, Jonice. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing well, trying to stay cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're in South Carolina, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> down here in the upstate of South Carolina, um, not too far from the Blue Ridge Escarpment. So, uh, you know, I'll I'll take that uh, degree of coolness uh, to heart, <laughs> along with the birds. Well, I'm excited um, to talk to you today, um, and especially about these letters to birds, which I just think is just such a lovely, wonderful, personal idea, and I can't wait to get into it. Um, I'm curious, though, what are you working on today? Wow. Um, you know, what am I not working on today? <laughs> I am um, trying to to get some edits done on the next book of uh, poetry, Joy is the Justice uh, We Give Ourselves, which is bird influenced, um, but um, sort of takes the, the, the birds at um, at their own identity. Mm. Right. So working working on that, getting ready to travel to 
um, Montana, uh, to Bozeman, Montana, and then to Chico Hot Springs for a writing workshop um, there. And um, and was listening this morning as, um, as, as things quiet down, listening to a scarlet tanager and a summer tanager um, in close proximity and wondering what those birds are thinking as they are beginning to turn their lives around to head back south to the tropics. So, you know, stuff like that, um, writing, <laughs> trying to write and thinking about all, all manner of bird brained things, Jonice. And, <laughs> um, and this is, uh, this is a big part of it. Yeah. Well, you've written, um, five letters to birds, um, that, are being made into episodes for Bird Note Daily. And um, each episode is, is you reading a letter to a different bird. Can you, I'm, I'm really interested in for you to talk to people about how you came up with the idea to write letters to birds. <laughs> um, you know, some people would say that, that that maybe requires some time on a counseling couch. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know, Janice, really with a lot of the questions, I mean, I'm a bird watcher, a birder and ornithologist, and so much of that is about identity, but so much of who we are as, as human beings um, is about our identities. And, you know, I've spent so much of my life in field guides trying to understand how to identify birds that... Um, it, it dawned on me um, a few years back that what I was actually doing was identifying with birds. And, and so we can talk about changes for bird names. We can talk about um, taxonomy and what birds are, but I'm concerned more these days with who birds are. And so it's very personal to me and birds mean a, a lot. Um, each bird means something to me. And so I wanted to dedicate um, that space, not just in my head to identifying birds, but in my heart to identifying with birds so that um, the conservation becomes personal so that maybe others understand that, you know, that one bird that we see is just as important as the next bird that we see. So that's what these letters are about. And of course, bird note um, there's no better place. I mean, I've been in love with what you guys have been doing at Bird Note for um, for for a long time, and this is a chance for me to to continue to be a part and hopefully give back in some way. How do you how do you form connections or relationships with birds? Um, slow down. <laughs> you know, um, it's a matter. For me of slowing down and I, and I think I was doing it I know I was doing it before the pandemic but I've spent a lot of time in my life chasing the next rare bird or that bird that happened to show up at some place that it wasn't supposed to and um, like many others I would flock to see that bird and gawk at it and and but then you know you begin to wonder what what's it like being blown off course what's it like not being where you're supposed to be um, what's it like um, being gawked at? And I could identify with a lot of that um, as a black man. And, and so again, it became personal for me. Um, and so the birds, I, in some ways, I think, you know, we talk about not anthropom anthropomorphizing birds. Um, I tend to, to ornithomorphize myself. Um, so to, to, to take on bird qualities, or at least to empathize with birds in ways um, in their struggles and their strifes, but also in their triumphs and their abilities to, to find, you know, freedom in this world with their wings. And so um, that, that means that birds have to become more for me than something on a list. They have to become something more than just the next thing to identify, but a being to identify with. And, um, and that creates in me a sense of caring. And I hope that sense of caring leads to conservation um, and in ways that there will be more birds for others to watch in the future. Watch, listen to, feel, whatever. 
Do you want to jump in and um, get into the the, the first letter? Um, Drew's going to read now a letter to an Eastern Wood Peewee. Dear Wood Peewee, thanks so much for bringing a bit of mystery to my backyard. There's something so tropical about having you in my little South Carolina acreage. It's not that Phoebe and Great Crested Flycatcher don't excite me, they do. But there's something about your sallying, your little leaps off the branch to nab a fly just makes you different. Okay, being totally honest, there has been a time or two when you perched high up on top of the neighbor's dying maple, and I thought you might be an olive-sided flycatcher, but you turned into better light and your vest just wasn't quite right. To top it off, you let a bit of your late summer song slip out. He, uh, so understandably simple and definitive. It's kind of easy when you say your name like that. So anyway, you found my little pseudo pine savanna satisfactory. I know you dig that kind of park-like setup. So be careful, Pee Wee. Travel safely back south. Hope to hear you here next year. Catch you, but not flies. Later, Drew. This just I just love that so much. It's funny because, you know, you did five of these and then getting to be in the room with you as you're recording them. Like after every one, I was sort of like, oh, that one's my favorite. <laughs> and then it's the next one. Oh, it's my favorite. <laughs> so right now that one's my favorite. Why the Eastern Wood Peewee? It's, it's such a... Um, you know, it's a bird that's easy to overlook were it not for its voice. I mean, it's a flycatcher. Um, and 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 flycatchers, I mean, for some people, they create an obsession. For other people, they're sort of like the little brown birds or little gray birds that are easy to ignore. Um, but when I hear an eastern wood peewee, it has such a distinctive and plaintive song that it 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 makes me, it comforts me. And, and it also is the song for me of late summer and early fall. Mm. And, um, and to watch Eastern wood peewees that, I don't know, they could have bred locally. Maybe they're from somewhere far away, but they bring, they, they bring themselves to me in my small spaces. And that's an acceptance, Jonice. You know, it's an acceptance. And and here again is a bird that we don't have to worry about naming because they tell us who they are, mm. right? And, I, you know, I think if we listen to the birds, tell us who they are, then we don't have to worry about giving them names of other beings. Um, they are who they are. And so wood peewees, you know, are, are great exemplars of that. Um, I want to get into the 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 next uh, letter. It's a, a letter to a Kentucky warbler. Why why the Kentucky warbler? Oh goodness, uh, <laughs> um, that that bird is. Um, it used to belong to a group of warblers, um, the the Operornis warblers that have now been split out by taxonomy, and so they aren't all in the same sort of kinship group. But um, Kentucky warblers are very secretive. They're what uh, many birders call skulkers. And so you may hear a Kentucky warbler, but you seldom see it. Mm. Um, but, but where a Kentucky warbler wants to be is almost in this sort of fairyland, right? This, you know, these, these um, sort of openings in the woods that have been created by disturbance that are all sort of fern gully tangled. Um, and, and that's where a Kentucky warbler wants to be. And when you see one, um, when it hops up on some moss covered log or on a vine hanging down and it sings that song, uh, you're transfixed. And, and there's nothing else in the world that matters in that moment except that one Kentucky warbler. So yeah, that deserved a letter. Are you ready to read it? Yes, I am. Okay. 
Dear Kentucky Warbler, are you real? It's hard to believe the way that citrine melds into your mossy olive drab back and how those black sideburns drip down your cheeks. I'm remembering a close encounter with you one mid-May day for about half an hour, and I thought I'd crossed over some ethereal boundary into another world. Even when I hear one of your singing, that deep ringing, radip, 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 telling me you're hidden deep in the gap tangle of some new greening spring woods, the resounding solo is a siren's draw into warblerific joy. Besides searching in vain for your other uber skulky friends like the Connecticut and Morning Warblers, you've revealed yourself to me from time to time as a bird blessing. I'm hoping that you find more tangles to hang out in and maybe make more little ones like yourself. I know it's getting harder to find the special tangly spots in big woods you need to be who you are, but I promise to keep working to save your viney world. Sure, Kentucky might be your name, but I claim you in my own state of heart and mind, my sideburn bird, adoringly, Drew. Okay, this one, well, it's my favorite, but <laughs> um, <laughs> this one of the three that you're reading today, this one feels and sounds most like a love letter. I, like I Jody, feel the connection that you have to this bird. It is. I, you know what? Um, I no longer keep a strict life list of any kind. I mean, I write poems for list really, I think, but I remember the Kentucky warbler that I'm sort of referencing and spending a half hour with this bird. I was in the botanical gardens just a little ways from here. And there's a, there's a gully, right? There's this 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 old gully that um, you know was good for much of nothing until it just sort of grew in. And one day I passed by it and I heard that song that pretty 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 pretty. And um, I stopped and I just sat down. I slowed down. And um, and this bird, I waited. I could see sort of movement. And this bird sort of appeared. I mean, within, I don't know, 10 or 12 feet of me. And I, I couldn't get enough of this bird. So, um, yeah, I fell in love with it as I, <laughs> you know, it just, um, it was just there and it just graced me with its presence. And it was no longer a secret except between the two of us. Hmm. And, um, and that secret that that Kentucky warbler brought to me from, um, from the tropics to be in that spot and that it, it allowed me to be in its presence for a half hour. Um, yeah, it, 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 it felt like that half hour that I spent with it lengthened my life by years because it was just this bird gracing me with its presence. So what's not to love about that? This is so, you can just feel, um, how personal this is for you. And, um, I, <laughs> I, I know that you spend a lot of your time working, um, but I can't, I'm just trying to picture you doing, <laughs> um, something else. Like I, I remember in you, you did an episode of StoryCorps for NPR and you talked about, I don't know if you remember this, cause it's been, I guess it's been a little bit, but you said, uh, from an early age that you knew you would study birds. Um, and I'm just wondering, like listening to how passionate you are about birds and about nature. Um, if you weren't studying birds and nature, how would you spend your time? <laughs> um, Is there another job? You're like, well, if I didn't do this, I would have been. Dead. Wow. Uh, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's been a. Um, bird saved my life. Hmm. So, um, you know, in that way, um, 
you know, not that I don't have love for people, family, friends. I, I mean, it's, um, uh, uh, but to, 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 to be in the presence of beings who so freely express themselves um, and, and who bring the world to us um, in ways that's, 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 um, that that's enabled me to live a life that on, I could have only dreamed of. And I did dream of it as a, I dreamt of it as a child. Um, but, but then to be able to sit here and share with you and to other people what it means, um, to, to be able to, to witness sometimes the freedom or choice, um, that, that sometimes bypasses us as human beings or that we allow to bypass or that we allow other people to take joy from us, birds then bring it back um, in, um, in spades. So, you know, that dream come true of being able to, to not just study birds, um, but to, to absorb them in a way and to be with them and to be in the places where they are um, that's life to me, Janice. And so, I, you know, I don't mean to wax dramatic in that way, but, you know, I was I was really on a path earlier in my life that felt more like an existence than a life. And so um, birds and nature and wildness, all of that has imbued in me a sense of vitality and a sense of living um, that has allowed me to 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 then love humanity um and 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 the world in a in a different way. And so as bitter um as as history has been, as bad as present day can sometimes be, birds give me hope for the future. And that's life. That's mm -hmm. life. Um, I want to get into this um, final letter we're going to hear today, but um, I hope that you're able to take some time before we all say goodbye here uh, today to look at the chat because people are really, what you're saying is resonating with so many people um, and they're saying just some lovely things to you that I hope that you get to see before you log off today. Um, and I'm only seeing just a few of them pop up, so I can only imagine if I actually... Um, opened it the chat um let's get into you want to read the letter to the pileated woodpecker i will okay. dear pileated woodpecker first off do you prefer a long eye or short just want to make sure i start off right personally i go for the pileated pronunciation and not the pileated one potato potato right speaking of names I've been wondering what you think of all the Lord God bird stuff. People mistaking you for the long lost ivory billed woodpecker. I mean, after all, that huge ivory bill used to give you guys a run for your biggest pecker money back in the day, right? Yeah, I know the difference is obvious, but trust me, I know what it's like for someone to see big and black and fall to assumption. Exhausting, ain't it? Anyway, just wanted you to know I appreciate all that mistaken identity nonsense you put up with, and it's pretty awesome the way your calls to make even the suburban woodlots seem like far away wildness. I really don't like the whole hen of the woods name some folks way back when gave you, but I'll let you choose the best name for you hoping the hammering headaches aren't too bad and the profiling doesn't cost you your own identity. All best, Drew. This one's my favorite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really I really love this one and I can feel your connection to this bird. What, what's, your, what's your relationship to the, the Pileata woodpecker? Well, wow, you know, it's it's um, it's it's a large uh, bird that 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 people make assumptions about, right? Um, a large, mostly black bird that people make assumptions about, um, and um, some some for good, some for bad. You know, so many people see pileated and wish they were something else, um, and uh, you know, it's sort of a lesson in acceptance. 
So again, um, another question of how we deal with identity and, and in dealing with identity for a pileated woodpecker, whether it's pileated or pileated, hen of the woods, um, or for some people that ivory bill that visited their suet feeder, um, and, and thinking about ivory bill woodpeckers, I think about um, you know a line from uh, of one of my favorite books from an author, um, um, Kilgo, uh, James Kilgo, that says that's called Deep Enough for Ivory Bills. Um, well, Deep Enough for Ivory Bills is inspiring, but Deep Enough for Ivory Bills um, is is aspirational in a way that that pileated have said, you know what, um, we'll exist in this space, and and we'll make the best of this space even though we may not be who you necessarily want to see or wish for. So yeah, that's a bit of empathy there. So, you know, you show up <laughs> and uh, you show out as who you are. And that's an important thing. And pileated with that, <laughs> they do that, right? I had to get oh. that in there. I had to get that in. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Um, I'm excited about, um, these uh you're getting kudos for your call there in the chat um, <laughs> um i'm excited about these letters to birds uh burden of daily episodes that people will get to hear you know uh, produced with you know beautiful bird calls and sounds and um those are coming up very soon so um i just i'm it, it's a it's a pleasure to to witness you reading these um live and in real time and to to hear you talk about your inspiration and um share your love of birds and i just um i just i i appreciate it so much um we've got some time to we got a lot of questions uh mm -hmm. from folks when they registered for this event so do you mind uh <laughs> me asking you a few uh, audience questions oh i would love it okay um here's one let's start with uh how can we attract more young people to birding what do you think about that I, you know, I, I think it's a matter of, um, of of letting the birds show you the way, right? And that that means not ignoring the birds that are sometimes right out of our back door um, that that maybe we don't see as inspirational, but they can be aspirational because they have wings, they fly. Um, European starlings and and um, and rock pigeons um, and house sparrows are are all immigrants. Um, and and I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, and and so to step outside on your back stoop and say that there is no nature there means that you haven't taken enough time to look. So I think sometimes when we dismiss a life um, in lieu of going further to find better, um, that we teach children to to not understand their environment. And nature is all around us, right? Um, your environment is what surrounds you. And so if you learn and, and help children, others understand what surrounds them, whether it's um, a, a pigeon or a peregrine falcon, then the next bird they see, um, you then begin to develop relationships one bird at a time. Um, you know, it's a bird by bird thing. So that's that's the way I like to go at it, Jonis. And everybody has a bird story, as I say. Mm -hmm. Do you? Uh, I don't know. I'm. I will be shocked if you have an answer to this. But do you actually have a favorite bird? Because that's <laughs> I, I've seen this question pop up, and uh, it's in one of the the questions that we received during the registration. So, do you have a favorite bird? Yes, absolutely. You do? Yes, it's the one with feathers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know what, Jonice? I yeah, I mean it, it varies from day to day. I you know I have these obsessions, you know, um, you know Bob White quail, the boys of my, the the birds of my boyhood, or loggerhead shrikes, um, code switching birds, or swallow tailed kites, um, the birds that, that you know exemplify um, flight, painted buntings, um, you know, flying art. Uh, you know, it's just so many, it's hard to choose. But then I, you know, I have chicken stories. I, you know, um, <laughs> and, 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 and we forget that they are birds. And so, you know, I think when I say that, it sounds flippant, 
but it is sort of a day-to-day -day thing with me and I become obsessed with, with birds. So if someone held my feet to the fire and they said, okay, what bird is most represented, you know, sort of in your art, in your collection, all that sort of stuff. Bob White quail, probably. And then after that, it's prairie warblers. And, you know, and, and, and then after that, it's swallowtail kites. And, you know, I tell people, if you've ever looked into the eyes of a, of a harpy eagle, um, you've looked into the eyes of, of, of a god. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, so actually, one of the things that I am working on is I'm sort of working on my own taxonomy, right? Um, and, and, and that taxonomy sort of involves my, my favorites, but I'm having a hard time with that. <laughs> um, speaking of like what you're working on and surroundings, uh, someone mentioned in the chat, they really want to know about the space you're working in right now, what we see behind you. If it's not too personal, can you share a little bit about your, your space here? I'm also very curious. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is a 10 by um 16 building um that was that was meant to be a storage building and one day i decided that it was going to be um something else and so it turned it was supposed to be a writing shack um it became the zoom room it's been in existence now for about seven or eight years i call it the thicket um <laughs> because it's thick with um my stuff um lots of bird art lots of books lots of bric-a-brac um, it's all me sort of crammed into um, this this space. So I get to be surrounded um, by birds, but also you see the marionette of, um, of Aldo Leopold there that was given to me by a friend years ago. Um, so it's 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 special space to me because um, I, I get to be surrounded by all of the things um, sort of that that I love and that that make me me and you know if 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 I'm to be honest I'm sort of a skulker as a bird I'm a little bit of a um I'm a little bit of a you know I talk about envying sparrows and sparrows love thickets and um a thicket is where I'm most comfortable right it's mm. that place that's sort of den like and it's close in around me and I feel protected um I feel embraced I feel safe I feel free to express myself. I feel feel I feel free to feel here. So the yes, this this is the thicket, and um, a lot of art by um, friends um, that has yeah you know there's a I mean everything from like that prairie warbler all the way on the back wall that's singing across the Blue Ridge mm -hmm. um, from Homer, Alaska, and um, to um, a, a great friend in Wisconsin who painted um, an ivory bill woodpecker surrounded by um, Carolina parakeets, but it's all sort of in this frame of a cathedral window. Yeah, so, you know, to ravens, um, figurines, and yeah, just all sorts of things like that that surround me here in the thicket. Is that where you feel most creative? Um. <laughs> You know, it's where I feel freest to think about being creative. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I of, of course it was invented so that I would come in here and I would have perfect writing posture, uh, you know, and and turn out thousands of words a minute. <laughs> but um, you know, the pandemic sort of changed that. It sort of changed the role of it, and I became more and more comfortable with speaking from this space. I don't create virtual backgrounds um, just because I want people to sort of see me, right? Um, so there's a bit of vulnerability in that, I think. And, um, you know, and, and birds are certainly vulnerable. And um, I at least want to share a little bit of that with them. So, yeah, it's it's creative space, but it's, uh, it's sort of a think pad. It's a feel pad more than a think pad. Well, thank you for... Uh giving us a little tour of sorts and, and sharing it with us. Um, another question that we received uh, from the, the audience here is, uh, what do birds do well that humans should aspire to replicate? Um, they, 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 they follow, um, you know, I'm going to say this, this is going to sound like a bit of anthropomorphizing, but 
Um, and, and what we know, we discover, we, we find out how much we don't know about birds on, a, on sort of a daily basis. Science does a wonderful job of telling us what we, um, what we can know, but there are some things that we can never know about birds. I mean, you know, when, when that scarlet tanager, those tanagers I was listening to, when they make a decision to leave um, my farm, our farm and go south, I mean, what, what triggers that? The science would say, well, it's day length. Um, you know, maybe it's, um, it's, 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 it's a diminishment of um, hormonal levels. It's all of these things, these factors that the statistics tell us when these things happen, then maybe this bird is likely to go south. But in that bird's brain, right, we can never know what it feels. Hmm. And so, um, and and so, what do birds do well that humans don't? Is that 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 birds are themselves, I think, um, in in ways that we can never know. Um, that we can never know the mind of a bird. But when that bird picks up, and you watch a bird fly, and it picks up, and it and it has this this faith and lift, right, and this trust. In, in a tailwind to fly maybe thousands of miles, you know, that, that, that's a miraculous thing. And so um, birds express, um, you know, they express their freedom and choice by flying only the flag of who they are. Mm. Um, their plumage is what they wave. And, and, and that tanager, whether it's red with black wings, or maybe it's a, 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 a molting um, first year um, male um, tanager or a female with that sort of splotchy um, red and green, just this, ob this absolutely beautiful bird. I can never know the minds of those birds. And so I think birds are free, wild birds are free in the way that humans can never be, but certainly we aspire to. Someone asked, um, how do you balance, and I'm like listening to you do this, <laughs> I feel like in real time, how do you balance the scientific <laughs> analytical part of your brain with the subjective artistic part? Great question. Um, I, I want, you know, when you think about balance, um, when you think about what you have to do to balance, and so imagine it, imagine um, stretched between your right brain that creative side and your left brain, that analytical side, imagine there's a board or a tightrope. How do you balance on that? I mean, you don't um, you, you don't give up one part of your brain for the other. And so you teeter, totter, back and forth, right? You've got your arms outstretched, you know, you're, and sometimes you almost lose your balance, but then you regain it. When I go too far right, then maybe I need to come back left a little bit. Um, as a writer, I, you know, I always want to get the science that we know. I want to get that important stuff in. Um, but then again, that part of the bird's brain that we can't know, I want to create some sort of ethos that, that gives us a sense, that gives that bird the sense of identity that it, it deserves. And so, I, you know, I'll, as a scientist, I'm, as, a, as a writer, as a creative writer, you know, I want, I want to get some people out of their heads. Um, but on that hike to your heart, I'm not telling you to leave your brain behind. Mm. Um, and, and so head and heart should not be mutually exclusive. And, and so that's the way I balance. And it's sort of this constant sort of back and forth. Um, you know, I don't ever think that you develop a skill of balancing by being balanced. I think it requires sort of some constant imbalance. And if you think about the way that our equilibrium works in our ears, we have fluid in our ears that's always, that's never really static, right? And so life is dynamic. A bird's life is dynamic. Um, and our thinking and our feeling should be constantly in flux and flow, um, flexing so that we're having to keep balance and we're thinking about this, but then we're feeling about that. And then we're thinking about how we're feeling and we're feeling about how we're thinking. So that's how I do it. You know, it's, um, it's a, it's a high wire act. How about that?
<laughs> That's a good explanation. Okay, so I'm talking to a scientist. And we're hearing a lot about artificial intelligence. Mm. Um, we have a question. Do you think that AI could enhance our understanding or decoding of bird language? What do you think about AI? And Oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I've got a stool over here, but I'm not going to step up on it quite yet. <laughs> it's actually a soapbox. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, I think, um, technology is wonderful um but what's in here um that's evolved over um all this time um to forsake that for an algorithm that can never totally be us i think is um you know i think we play with fire a bit in that and I, you know, in my bird example, quite frankly, is, you know, use technology to help you understand maybe what's singing out there, but don't depend on it. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, so something tells us that this is the bird that's singing. Um, and some people, you know, they say, okay, that's absolutely what's singing. Why not, you know, verify, right? Um, certainly if someone knocks at your door, and they say, um, I'm your best friend from, from 20 years ago. Let me in. And, and, and you don't verify. You do that at great risk. So I, I think um, that, that artificial intelligence um, has, has things to teach us. Um, but I think we have more in our brains to learn than artificial intelligence has to teach us. And, and so um, that gray matter, right. Um, that that's, that's in our, in our brains um, is important. And, uh, and, and so from a, a natural history perspective, even, um, you know, it's important sometimes to go home and not know what you saw or heard. Um, it's important to let sort of wonder and awe be in your brain mm -hmm. and 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 to to think about it and to feel something about it and to be inspired to want to learn more. And maybe part of that is technology. But maybe part of that is you doing some old fashioned page flipping in a book or thinking or writing. And and. Um, and it becomes a more intimate experience, I think, Jonice. I think for me, learning is an intimate thing. Mm. And if I give that intimacy over to, um, to, to something that I don't know, um, that maybe does that, that maybe doesn't have, that doesn't have the capacity to feel, then I think I'm selling out. So I'm not going to sell out on, on evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm just not, and, um, I, and I'm not going to sell out on science. Um, but I, but I, you know, the birds, um, I don't want anybody reproducing something that is near bird. That's almost bird. Um, and that it flies across the sky and I see it and there's just a slight hitch um in the flapping of the wing and i'm like oh yeah that's one of those near birds that they invented so that we'd have something to look at after all the other birds were gone no thank you i'm going to try to get in a couple more questions from the audience here before our time here uh together ends um someone asked how do you feel that someone without resources and they're talking about money here uh can support nature and birds in an impactful way that's that's an absolutely great question. I think, Jonice, one of the big the big connections um, that we all have to nature is um, is in our stomachs, right? Um, we all have to eat, and 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 food, um, good whole food, comes from clean air, clean water, um, clean soil, um, and 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 those things are important. So I think that, um, for example, community gardens, church gardens. Um, any way that that we can support human well-being um, on the earth, through the earth is important. That's a critical thing. And, and I can't tell someone to care about faraway wildness when their stomach is empty every night when they go to bed, when they have to worry about their safety 
in a space. So, you know, I, I think, I think about that a lot. You know, I think about, you know, um, going somewhere to watch birds with binoculars hanging around my neck that are worth more than three or four people are going to make in a month. Um, and, and what, what do I do when I go into that community if my binoculars are up to see rare birds, but all around me, people are suffering. Mm. So I have to take those binoculars down and I need to see the wider viewpoint and think about that. And I need to think about that when, um, not just when I'm watching birds, but I have to think about that when I'm watching politicians um, do what they do. You know, I have to think about that um, when people um, don't aren't meriting the justice that they deserve. I have to think about all of those things. Um, and and when you think about those things, then you, you, you your economy becomes different, I think. You begin to think about um, the well-being not just of of birds but of human beings. and they are inextricably linked. Um, if the birds do well, someone said if the birds do well, we do well. Um, and 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 that I think needs to be the measure. Sometimes we need to flip the coin um, and and see that side first. Maybe that coin is a penny. Um, but if if that coin is a penny um, and we flip it enough and we see that side of treating nature better, then pennies add up to dollars. And I think mm -hmm. the economy begins to change around that. Uh, final question from the, the audience here. Um, what do you feel most hopeful about uh, when you think about the future of bird conservation? You know, I, I feel most hopeful about, honestly, um, <laughs> you know, it's sometimes it's it's a bird that, I you know, I haven't banded it. I can't prove that it's the same bird, but there is a bird that, a scarlet tanager that's in the top of a mulberry tree on the same day that it was in the top of the mulberry tree the year before. And that bird is singing in, 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 in a dawn chorus in this way uh, that's triumphant, that says, you know what, I survived the cycle. I survived all that nature sort of had to dish out, but I also survived all of the foolishness that humanity um, has sort of erected to, to, to short stop my survival. That's hopeful to me um, that, you know, that persistence in a perched bird. It's hopeful to me when someone um, says that, you know what, I, I saw a bird and I watched that bird and maybe it wasn't a rare bird, but they reveled in that one bird. It's hopeful to me that people showed up <laughs> on a Wednesday <laughs> midday um, to talk about birds and to think about something beyond themselves. That's hopeful for me. Sure, Lanham, this has just been um, just wonderful. This has been a delight. And um, I, again, like I've told you a bunch of times, I think now, but I just really appreciate you taking time um, to join us, to talk to us. Uh, I certainly thank you for your gorgeous letters to birds. And um, it's just been a pleasure today. And again, I hope you take a little bit of time. I'm going to wrap up with some housekeeping here, but to look through these comments because people are really uh, what you're saying is resonating with a lot of folks. And I wanted to give you an opportunity. How can people keep up with uh, the current work you're doing? I know uh, they can find your books um, and they can find you online and such, but like, uh, where can people keep up with what you're working on? Well, um, the most convenient place is probably um, Instagram right now. And I, you know, I, I post a, a bunch of stuff there um, at Wild and in Color. Um, a new website um, that will um, pop up um, very soon, I promise. I've been working, have people working on it for a while. So that'll be there and I'll make sure that that's available there. But right now, um, the old website is still up, but IG is probably that place where you find out what I'm obsessing on um, at the current moment. Is your Instagram under your, just your name? Uh, yes, it's at Wild and in Color. J. Drew Lanham is my name. So at Wild and in Color. Got it. Thank you, Drew. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. And Janice, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you to the folks at, 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 at Bird Note. Um, and um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to be bird-brained and bird-hearted um, with so many <laughs> folks. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed today's conversation and want to be part of our work to help people feel more connected to the natural world, please consider donating at any amount that feels meaningful to you. You can use the link in the chat. Uh, you can learn more about BirdNote at birdnote.org or by following us at BirdNote Radio on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you'll receive an email uh, with the link to this recording in the next couple of days. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us.